people are doing very dumb and crazy things now. Uh, I have it always to be so that we're not alarmed as long as we're walking in you. And Lord, I do pray that you'll bless and protect our uh, family tonight and all other Christian families and all other people from ourselves, from our flesh, from uh, the devil and from the demons of hell and from evil people in the family, evil people in the church, evil people in the world. Place, Lord, upon us the whole armor of God. Cover us and cleanse us through the blood of Christ and make us to be whiter than snow. Surround us with the band of your holy angels and the wall of your holy fire. Not only, Lord, for this time, but throughout the remainder of this evening and throughout the remainder of our lives. Lord, help the people to take heed to what I've already said and what I'm getting ready to say now from your holy word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. This was not originally in this sermon tonight. Those of you who were with us in the devotional service this morning, you actually heard me say it just so happened that we read something from Dr. Charles Haddon Spurgeon that was so apropos to this message tonight. And I don't even know if I can even go deep into the message tonight uh, because of what I'm getting ready to share with you. For those of you who have never heard of Dr. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he, he is called the Prince of Preachers. And there's good reason for that. Uh, Not only was he the prince of preachers back then, but the truth of the matter is no one would dispute that he's the prince of preachers even today. He's been dead for many years. God gave him the mother load of unction and anointing, talent and ability in preaching and teaching and writing about the Word of God. There's no doubt about that. He was a a man of deep prayer. Not only did he pray in the pulpit, he prayed at home, and he believed in the power of prayer. And if you have not read his great classic devotional morning and evening, You don't need any other devotional. Just get that one. And you'll be good to go for the rest of your life as long as you put the Bible first, which you always did. And so I was not trying to gather information for this sermon tonight. This was a devotional that we read this morning in our Standing Between the Living and the Dead devotional service. And it was so powerful I said in the devotional service that I was going to use this this uh, quote from Spurgeon tonight. He started off by reading First Peter chapter one verse four. He always started his devotionals with the Word of God. That's another reason why I love is devotional. It is based upon the Word of God. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, 
that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Dr. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, Vanish forever all thought of indulging the flesh if you would live in the power of your risen Lord. Exactly how many years ago did Spurgeon die? I noticed quite a few. I looked it up quite quick. Right on that thing there again. What year did he die? What's the date that he died? Now, I want you to, I, I want you to, to, to hear this because I want to show you how powerful the Holy Ghost of God is in the life of certain people. He being dead, yet speaketh. It were ill that a man who is alive in Christ should dwell in the corruption of sin. And this is what we have going on so much in the church, and it doesn't matter, matter whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. That's what's going on in the church today. People claiming to be Christians, but living in sin. And then he says, why, why seek ye the living among the dead? Said the angel to Mary Magdalene. Should the living dwell in the sepulchre? Should we as Christians live in sin? Live in the darkness of our evil as so many of us are doing today? Starting with pastors and the so-called pastor's wives and their teenagers and their children and the deacons and the trustees. There's so much whoredom going on in the church today and so much homosexuality from the pulpit back to, back to the uh, usher at the door, from the choir box on through the pulpit and with the pulpit and to the usher all the way out to the greeter that I'm convinced that there are more people lost in the church than are saved now. There are more tares, there are more terrorists than the wheat. Should divine life be immured in the Chanel house of fleshly lust? He died January 1892, over 100 years ago. January the 31st, 1892. So he made it to 1892. Over 100 years ago, he wrote this, The Treasury of David, Lectures to My Students, all bona fide classics. You know the man spent time with God in prayer. And I thank God he did, and I thank God God gave him that fresh unction and anointing every day. And I thank God that God moved upon him, an uneducated man, by the way, a man who did not go to Bible college or seminary. He tried to go, but it didn't all work out. So he just started his own college. Of 
over 100 years ago, he wrote this. And here we are, being blessed by it because it is apropos to our situation, probably more so than to his situation in that day, even though uh, they, had, they had some situations too. How can we partake of the cup of the Lord and yet, just let it, just let it sit. Let's give it to her, let it sit. Don't worry about it right now, just leave it. And yet drink the cup of the devil, Belial. Surely, believer, from open lusts and sins you are delivered. Have you also escaped from the more secret and delusive lime twigs of the satanic fowler? Have you come forth from the lust of pride, dear Christian friend? in the church today, dear pastor friend, dear pastor's wife friend, dear trustee board member, dear choir box member, dear deacon, dear prophet, dear prophetess, dear evangelist and evangelistas. I just made up that word, so don't worry about it. Don't write me. Have you escaped from slothfulness? Pardon me. Have you clean escaped from carnal security? Are you seeking day by day to live above worldliness? Or have you gotten to the point, dear Christian friend, that you have no interest in the world whatsoever, really? There were things at one time you could tolerate a little bit, now you can't even tolerate that. The pride of life and the ensnaring vice of avarice. How about it, dear Christian friend? Was Spurgeon a prophet to you over 100 years ago? Remember, it is for this that you have been enriched with the treasures of God. If you be indeed the chosen of God and be loved by him, do not suffer all the lavish treasure of grace to be wasted upon you. Follow after holiness. How about it, dear Christian friend? It's not about you and me. It's not about you. It's about God and what he wants. We don't hear too much about holiness today, do we? Not even from the holiness churches. So, in fact, some of the most unholy churches are holiness churches. Don't tell me it's not true, because I know I was raised in them. And some of the most unholy churches are Baptist churches. Don't tell me that's not the case, because I was raised in the Baptist church, too. My dad was a Baptist preacher. My mother is a holiness preacher. Grand, her grandfather was the founder of a holiness denomination out of Florida, reaching into Georgia. I, on both sides of my family, uh, we have preachers. I was raised in the church. And both churches and all of the churches that we were uh, in, it was quite a few, were unholy, not holy. 
They used to talk about holiness. Some of the women used to dress in the holiness way. Don't bow your head yet. It's not time to pray, but they were not holy. If you'd allow me to say they were holy. I know you don't like it, but it's true. <clears throat> they had long dresses on, but it was easy to pull them up. Sad to say. And it's worse now. Because as I said, ladies and gentlemen, there are many people in the church today, but they have never been born again. They have never been saved. Now, the young women and the young men who go to the Holiness Church and to the Baptist Church, they come to church with many skirts on. And Bible churches, too, evangelical churches. When they sit down, you can see what you should not be able to see. Don't tell me it's not the, the case. It is. When they get up, you see too much that you ought not to see. But they claim to be holy. Well, we don't hear much about holiness as we used to because there's no holiness going on in the church. The whole church, in the words of Isaiah, the whole head is sick. The whole church is compromised. I thank God for God 7,000 preserved his true holy people and God's remnant, but they're few in number. God's 7,000 and God's remnant are probably those who, who come to church on Sunday night, even when the pastor does not show up. They have somebody in there who everybody knows they don't know what they're doing. They didn't come. The remnant and the 7,000, that's spread across all the churches of the world now. So it's probably one or two people in each church, I guess. They, don't, they didn't come to hear from some little preacher boy that you're hoping turns out right. And he's saying all kinds of ungodly, unscriptural things. They came to hear the pastor, but the pastor, he's off somewhere else. <clears throat> 